Okay, um, so welcome everyone to to this uh, this morning's Bolin Center seminar. So this is the official seminar uh, series of uh, research area four on biochemical cycles and climate. And uh, we are very happy to uh, have uh, our former colleague, uh, Christian Beer giving us, uh, giving us a presentation. Um, so Christian Beer is uh, formerly of Stockholm University, but he is uh, since some time back the professor at the um, University of Hamburg. He's the Heisenberg Professor for Dynamics of Soil Processes in the Institute of Soil Science. So Christian has um, a broad background, I would say, in studies of ecosystem, vegetation, and soil dynamics at a lot of scales. He has worked um, at the global scale a lot, uh, mainly using models and remote sensing data, but also he has done a lot of very nice work in integrating field data with, with process-based models, model development, and really asking questions about, about the role of soils in the, in the carbon cycle. Uh, also, he has done a lot of interesting research, really bridging gaps across scales as you can when you, you have a successful mix of field data and, and models. And uh, I think the, the, the research he is presenting today on protection of permafrost soils from thawing by increasing herbivore density is a great example of, of, of how you can use field observations and field experiments together with models to really uh, you know, look at the scalability of, of processes and, and, and problems and solutions. Um, so before I, I uh, ask Christian to start, I will also tell all of you that are attendees that we will have, of course, time for questions uh, after Christian's presentation. He will talk for roughly 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we have time for discussion. Uh, we anticipate to end before 11 o'clock. But if you have a question, um, you can either write it in the Q&A that you have on the bottom of your screen, or you can go to the participants function and then click raise your hand. And if you do that, then uh, uh, Magnus and Laila who are monitoring the, the session will uh, uh, add you uh, to, the, to the presentation and you will be able to turn on your camera and ask the question in, in person, so to say. But if you prefer to just write the question, you can use the Q&A function. Okay, so with that, I'd like to uh, hand over the word to, to, to Christian. Yeah, uh, Gustav, thanks a lot for the introduction and um, welcome to this seminar today. Uh, I'm really happy to have a seminar at the Bolin Center Research Area 4. Um, and um, it's really a pity that I cannot see you all now in the room and cannot see your faces. Um, yeah, this is, uh, this is live today. Um, so I hope then for the next time that uh, we can really have um, uh, a, a joint seminar together again. So I hope that I can share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, it looks good. Okay, so this is this is uh, really a topic for the Bolin Center Research Area Four because it's a collaboration um, between Hamburg, uh, also between uh, University of Hamburg and Stockholm University, uh, in a sense that we started the work really. When, when, when I was still there at uh, Stockholm University. Um, so it's really coming out of, um, of the research there uh, and then continued and, and finished uh, the paper here at the uh, uh, University of Hamburg. And this is also a collaboration, a joint collaboration really with uh, um, Sergei Zimov and, and Nikita Zimov uh, from uh, Far East in uh, Russia. And also Johan Olofsson um, from uh, Umeå. Um, important is also here in this work, uh, Philip Porada. Uh, he also started the work together with me at Stockholm University, but uh, he's now also at uh, University of Hamburg here um, uh, as a junior professor. So uh, we're happy to continue this uh, collaboration. So the topic is about permafrost soils. So I would really like to give you some introduction to permafrost soils. Um, Probably many of you have heard about it um, and about the relevance of it. Uh, I just want to summarize on a few slides about it. Um, and then uh, I will present you the idea from the Gesimov and uh, in particular then also show you what is the topic of the paper and the topic of the paper is to analyze the plausibility of this idea 
at a large scale and over a long time. This will be done with uh, land surface model simulations. We are using this called uh, this uh, land surface model JS Bach, so Jena scheme for biosphere atmosphere coupling in Hamburg. Um, and I will show you how we do the simulations and what are the results. And then I will finish with some discussion and perspectives. Okay, so a few slides to warm you up about the problem of permafrost soils uh, and uh, global warming. So we, we see here um, a typical um, estimate of the Arctic amplification, um, the current Arctic amplification of warming. You see the um, mean annual temperature difference between um, the last decade uh, compared to the uh, period 51 to 80. And you really see that in the Arctic, there is a much stronger warming recorded than, uh, than on average. The rest, and this is also really seen on the right-hand side, um, at this picture of the uh, latitudinal bands. Yeah. So we, we have something about three degrees Celsius, two to three degrees Celsius here in the Arctic, warming and, and otherwise on average is something about one degree. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. And we'll do this. Yes, we can. Okay, so we, we have a strong warming in, the re in this uh, region. And uh, at the same time, there's a lot of organic matter that is stored in these permafrost affected soils, which we call jelly soils. Um, and you see here the map uh, published by, by Gustav in 2014, Gustav and colleagues, uh, still a very important map uh, that shows you the organic carbon content in these soils. Um, on the left-hand side in this red box, you have some comparison about organic carbon contents uh, in, in the Earth system. Atmosphere stores something about 850 petagrams. Carbon, all soils together, probably 2,800 petagrams organic carbon. And in these permafrost affected soils, we have about 1,000 petagrams organic carbon. So um, um, you really see that this is a huge area um, that is covered by permafrost affected soils, and there's a lot of organic carbon there. And I just want to give you some idea on why is there so, so much organic carbon stored in these permafrost affected soils. You see here typical profile. So these are statistical, so these are averages of profiles for different uh, soil types, crystals, turbids, and orchids. Um, and you see then here in depth, the organic carbon content is hardly decreasing. It's decreasing a bit, of course, but it's really in the, also in the subsoil here, sometimes increasing again, in particular here in these cultivated soils, in these turbids. Um, so there's a lot of um, organic carbon stored in this permafrost region in the soil. So actually we, we differentiate the permafrost affected soils into some active layer that is thawing each summer. Um, it can be like 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters, one meter. Um, and then below that, we have what we call permafrost flow. So the soil that is, that is always frozen for at least uh, two years. And you see that a lot of organic matter is stored here in these really always frozen sediments, soils. Again, something about the warming. So we have seen the atmospheric warming, but really these soils are also warming. The permafrost is warming. You see some estimate from, from really stations, time series, how the permafrost soils really warm uh, during the last decades. And um, uh, you see here the examples of different stations on the left-hand side. And then uh, on the right-hand side, we uh, have a summary of the trends from different stations here uh, for the permafrost and for the atmosphere. Um, and you can really see how here the permafrost is really also changing, not the same like the atmosphere, but is of course laying behind, but it's also uh, warming. So there's a lot of organic matter which is frozen. So that cannot be decomposed at the moment because it's frozen. It can warm and it can thaw, and also the active layer can warm. So both together, the warming and the thawing can lead to an uh, increase of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane mainly, 
to the atmosphere. And in this slide, I just want to summarize uh, what is really the relevance of, this, of these additional emissions to the atmosphere. You see on the right-hand side um, from Charlie Coven's paper in 2015, you see some estimations on what we think at the moment, how much carbon dioxide can be released into the atmosphere during the century. And, and then we get some numbers of, of 10, 20 petagrams for, for one climate scenario and something like 60, 80 petagrams for uh, in another climate scenario for the, for the RCP 8.5 scenario. So this is, of course, these are numbers with high uncertainty, but it's just to show you the order of magnitude. So the, so the order of magnitude is something about, I would say 100 petagrams carbon are possible. On the left-hand side, you see a diagram um, from, so results from Earth system models that show you how much CO2 can we actually emit into the atmosphere anthropogenically, so, so how much fossil fuel burning can, can we do um, still to keep the warming below a certain target like two degrees Celsius or, or 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if you, if you just uh, use these earth system model runs then and invert this amount of cumulative total CO2 emissions, then we get numbers also with high uncertainty, but numbers around 200 petagrams carbon. Um, so that means at the moment we emit like 10 petagrams each year. So that would be like 20 years or so. Um, so now there are two problems here uh, that, that, that I show on the slide. First thing is um, actually our permafrost carbon emissions are of the same order of, of magnitude. There's uncertainties here and there, uh, that's for sure. But as you can see, um, it's really relevant to estimate if there's uh, like 10 petagrams carbon coming out of the permafrost regions or if it is more 100. It is really relevant for the uh, still the um, CO2 emission budget that we, that we still have available to keep the, the warming below a certain target like 2 degrees Celsius. The other problem that's also mentioned here in the slide is that these earth system model runs here do not have the permafrost carbon considered and also no methane fluxes considered usually. So um, also these estimations here then are really like coming with a high uncertainty. Okay, so thawing permafrost is then really I would say, um, in a sense, dangerous for, for our future climate. And what was now the idea by Zygi Zimov and Czerski, uh, I think 20 years back, his idea was <clears throat> that, okay, in the past, in the Pleistocene area, um, we, we had a completely different ecosystem there in these permafrost regions. And, and we had, in particular, huge herbivores like mammoths and, and horse, a lot of horses and, and other herbivores. And uh, this kind of ecosystem, <coughs> um, this different ecosystem uh, probably promotes permafrost. Um, or in, in other words, the idea was, if we have a lot of herbivores like horses, reindeer and so on in these ecosystems, then they trample down the snow. Um, they trample down the snow in winter, as you can see here nicely in, on, the, on the picture. And with that, they destroy or they, they lower uh, the very important insulation layer, the snow layer, that insulates uh, the soil from the very cold atmosphere. So you reduce the insulation, means you cool the soil. And on the right-hand side, you see some observations from Zegezimov. Um, uh, with two stage or two temperature loggers in, in, the, in the soil here in 90 centimeter depth. Um, one situation inside the park and one situation in blue is outside the park. So you can really see in summer is almost like the same temperature because there's no snow. Um, but then in winter, you can see the effect of, of the animals here. Uh, that really the uh, temperature is much cooler inside the Pleistocene Park. So he fenced, 
huge area and put a lot of animals in there and let them trample down the snow and then you can measure this effect. And then we met 2018 at the conference in, uh, <clears throat> at the BioGeomon um, conference in uh, Czech Republic and discussed about it. So what does it really mean for, for the future? Actually, this is something that with, with these current observations, you cannot really assess. Can this effect here be larger than the climate warming signal that we expect in these, in these areas? This is basically something uh, that, that, uh, that I want to uh, discuss in this paper. But first, again, about me uh, the mechanisms that we are talking about. So there's, <clears throat> there's an effect of snow density on a soil temperature because snow is insulating layer. And um, this is a negative correlation. So the higher the snow density, the lower is the soil temperature. But there's actually two, two uh, different mechanisms that are responsible for, for this observation, for this correlation structure. And, and the first uh, mechanism is really about the snow layer depth. So they really decrease the snow layer depth. Um, and the other, uh, mechanism is about thermal divisivity. So the, also the thermal properties of the snow change. If you increase the density, then um, the heat conduction is much, much more efficient, so to say. Yeah. So with like both effects, decreasing layer depth, but also increasing thermal divisivity, uh, then uh, this insulation layer, um, this insulation effect is lowered. So I already mentioned then what is really the idea of the paper then, the research question here. The question is, would it be theoretically possible to prevent future permafrost thawing by increasing herbivore density in these permafrost regions, even under the strongest warming scenario that, that we apply usually, the RCP 8.5 scenario. So that's also why we take the RCP 8.5 scenario, because we want to really go to the limit, as we see, um, even under the strongest warming, uh, warming, would it be possible? And how to do this? So we are applying a land surface model. Um, the land surface model, J.S. Bach, as it is published in uh, these papers in Kishi, so from Ito Kishi, 2014, and Philippe Arad, 2016. It's a typical land surface model, which uh, resolves the energy dependence uh, in a vertical domain. Uh, it resolves the um, relative balance here in the red box. Uh, then we have um, this as a boundary condition to the soil. And then we have the heat conduction, the vertical heat conduction, which is expressed in the equation here on the right-hand side. Um, we have a five-layer snow scheme on top of the soil. Uh, and there are two extras to, to a classical land surface scheme. So the first extra is that we consider the latent heat of fusion. So we consider freezing and thawing in the soil. And this latent heat of fusion is uh, also then taken into account into the heat conduction equation. Um, and we also consider a dynamic MOS model here. Uh, you see the, the green box. So uh, bryophytes and lichens are considered in this model also dynamically so they can grow and die. Uh, and this additional layer is also then uh, insulating depending on the moisture of the layer. This is really the work by uh, Philip Porada. Um, and he in particular did also this work in, at Stockholm University to put really this model into the, this uh, version of the JS Bach land surface scheme. Um, okay, so I don't want to show you a lot of slides about JS Bach evaluation, but I think at least for, for two, uh, variables that's important and uh, in this work the first variable is snow depth so are we somehow covering the, the observed snow depths uh, at a large scale and these are then um, simulation so standard control simulations for the model and and uh, we compare then our results to observations at site level so this is always problematic because we are not using the exact meteorological data from all these sites but some global climate data. But nevertheless, what we can see is usually there's, there's usually there's a little bias. There's usually no bias in, in the thaw depths that we estimate here for the December, January, February uh, thaw depths uh, from the model compared to the observations. There is, as you can see on the map, 
some problems in Norway, so in some mountain regions, of course, our land surface model has assumes flat grid sites, so in really these mountain regions, there can be some problem, maybe also with the precipitation data. If we look into Siberia and Canada, US, so the, the huge areas here of permafrost, uh, that looks, looks uh, pretty okay. Um, what is more interesting even, because we're talking about insulation, what is even more interesting is uh, how is about this insulation strength strength and uh, here we compare now on the uh, y axis um, the difference uh, between uh, 20 meter, 20 centimeter soil temperature and air temperature yeah, so the difference between soil temperature and air temperature compared to the snow depths so the snow depths is increasing and the insulation strength strength should should also increase and the difference should not uh, increase. Uh, any further. And that's what you see here also in these observations in uh, black. And this is now two curves for uh, different periods in time for no uh, November, uh, December, and January, and for February, March, April separately. And you can see that there is some problem here in uh, February, uh, March, April, and spring uh, at, at small snow depths here, but, but usually uh, we fo really follow the pattern here. So we think we can use the model in terms of the snow uh, insulation. And also then I would like to show you some permafrost temperature evaluation uh, at, at boreholes uh, uh, around the Arctic. And this is a root mean square error of uh, two degrees Celsius or so difference. We have sometimes an overestimation probably in the Southern region and, and in Western Siberia here. Uh, we have sometimes in the uh, here in the uh, East Siberian region, we have sometimes an underestimation of soil temperature. But overall, we think the model is suitable to actually address the question that 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 we asked. Okay, let's let's go now to the data, um, and this is really um, data coming from Johan Olofsson uh, from Umeå uh, University. Uh, they have data from. Uh, a feeding experiment uh, on the left-hand side, so uh, where you really have an enclosure uh, uh, of animals, um, and you have an exclosure site, and, and then you can compare the snow depths. And the interesting thing is here, so this is really intensively, so this is really 480 individuals per square meter, a lot of animals in this in these, um, fenced site here, in the feeding site. But interestingly, the uh, distributions even do not overlap. So this is a huge reduction of snow. Actually. On the right-hand side, we see then observations from an island, Holmön, uh, in, in uh, northern Sweden, where they put about 15 uh, individuals per square meter in winter. Um, and then um, we have data about really the path when they go and the crater when they graze through the snow. Um, you, uh, then we really have information here how the snow depths really change from, from no impact here in, in uh, yellow then to these areas. In the Pleistocene Park, the Gizimov, uh, he told me they have a snow depth reduction of 50%, but they also have a very high herbivore density of about 100 individuals per square kilometer. Um, so this is basically some observations that we found um, in order to assess how much could we reduce the snow depths in the model, basically. Yeah? So this is then parametrized. So we parametrized the snow depth reduction by about 30 to 40% and see what is the effect then on, on soil temperature, basically. And I don't want to go into a lot of equations. I just want to show you, this is a, like the snow density dynamics model that we are using. And there's one factor here is compaction factor. So it's just telling you how much is the snow compacting in time. Um, and, and we just increase this factor in this experiment when we assume more to have more animals uh, in the landscape. Uh, so in the control, so we do two model runs, a control model run with the compaction factor as, as it was before. And then what we call the Pleistocene Park model experiment, and we increase this factor um, by one third. And what we then just get is 
So this, these are these are model results. What we just get is really um, the uh, snow depth reduction by about uh, 30 to 40 percent, and a density reduction by about 50 percent, uh, which also leads then to a thermal diversity increase of about 50. 50%. Yeah? So these are relative changes here. Um, so it's just showing you that that we, with these changes in this in this uh, compaction factor, we really get in a model what what we what we want to have uh, about 50% reduction of snow depth and 50% increase in this thermal divisivity. Right. So now these are the final results of uh, permafrost temperature. You see on the left hand side uh, the control run present day estimates, and in red you see the more or less observed border of the permafrost zone, and in color you see the permafrost temperatures here in degrees Celsius. We have some problem, as I said here in East Siberia. I think these permafrost temperatures at uh, so so below minus ten. And, and minus 15 to, to minus 15 degrees is a bit too low, actually. Um, so I would not like to concentrate to this to this uh, too much. I think it's due to forcing data problems. Um, uh, but overall, uh, you see, like in the control model run, if you go into the future, this is the picture B here. We really see how the soil soil is warming. Uh, it is 8.5 uh, scenario and also how permafrost region disappears. So the permafrost region shrinking, and also the still remaining permafrost areas like here, they are really warm. So permafrost temperatures at about minus one, minus two, minus three degrees Celsius, instead of minus five or, or minus six. Um, and then we have the plasticine park experiment result. So of course, the control model run is the same for both. And then in uh, 2010, we started to diverge with a, with a, a compaction factor of the snow. So we, we have a, uh, a different kind of snow scheme now here on the right hand side. And you can really see that, uh, yes, still the soil is a bit warming. So if you compare these regions here, color scale, scale is the same. You can see that the permafrost soil is warming, but not that strong. This is really important because also in future, so this is a model run until 2100, but like these areas here, will, they will still uh, disappear in the future until 2300 because it's so warm, the temperature is so warm. So um, this is not the case here in this places and park experiments. And so even, so that, like this is our conclusion that even under this very strong warming scenario 8.5, uh, uh, there is hope, or at least these model results, they show that there's hope that increasing the animal density in these regions can really save permafrost from uh, thawing. Yes, so then of course, there's this, a lot of discussion about it. Huh? Um, how much or how many herbivores can you put into the landscape? This is basically the first question everybody asks me now, and I have no idea about it. So I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a specialist for, for heavy wars. Um, of course, I'm talking with people about it, but um, this, this is, of, of course, a big question. So we have about 100 animals per square kilometer in Chesky. You cannot maintain this probably on an Arctic scale. This is uh, probably not feasible. Um, the 15 uh, animals per square kilometer on Holman Island, this is a typical example how people operate at the moment. So this is something maybe that, that we could we could maybe reach. Um, on average, I think the literature says that on, on average we have something like one to five individuals per square kilometer at the moment at a pan-arctic scale. Um, but in former times, uh, in particular in the Soviet Union time, it was much more. So like with these sensitivity model experiments, changing this parameter, the compaction factor, and also changing the moss uh, mortality factor. With these experiments, we just wanted to sh uh, see, is it really important to have so many animals there, or can we maybe also live with, with less? And the, like then you see here on the x-axis, 
uh, a resulting slow depth relative difference, 10, 20, 30%. Yeah, so 30% was really the, or 40, 50% was the difference in, in, the, in the results I showed before. And now we see what happens with less snow depth reduction. And still, the permafrost extent and the permafrost temperature change here, but you can see still with these 15% reduction, that is, this is really the, like the case on uh, Holmerin Island. Uh, still, you can really save uh, the permafrost temperature also in, in a lot of uh, regions. The permafrost extent is getting lower, but it's not really disappearing like, um, like uh, in the control model run. So this can be also maybe enough, and this is some of the perspectives, some of the future work that needs to be done, of course, to really work at the landscape scale and considering all kinds of factors, uh, not only the effects of the animals on snow, but also the effects on the ecosystem in, in general. Um, so I've put for discussion and perspective, I, yeah, lots of unknowns. I just put three points. Uh, one is the relationship snow compaction as a function of heavy water density. We have seen some data from really um, uh, exclosure sites and like individual observations. So people go there and measure what happens if reindeer is going through or is passing by and measure the snow depths. But at the landscape scale, it's pretty unclear at the moment where are the animals and how are they moving and, and how is really the snow reduced at the landscape scale. So this is a question that uh, I in particular also uh, ask people like uh, um, uh, Bruce Forbes from, from the uh, Carter project, um, um, people like um, um, Otto Habeck here from University of Hamburg. So this is something I'm also interested to work further. Um, then what I mentioned also is to include the further effects of these herbivores on ecosystem functions, on, on productivity, for example, on vegetation type. Um, what we considered a bit is the effect of the moss layer because and people said, okay, um, you, destroy, you, you destroy the snow layer, but at the same time with a lot of herbivores, you also destroy the moss layer. And then in summer, you can have uh, the problem, the opposite effect that you, that you are missing this insulation layer in summer. And that's also why our model setup was, uh, was quite useful because we have this dynamic MOS model and we, we just accounted for this effect and also increased the mortality of the MOS layer. Uh, and, and just the result was that there was not a big effect from this MOS layer, it was really much larger from the snow. Um, and then, of course, people ask me all the time, what are the economic possibilities of uh, heavy war management in the region? Can we really increase uh, this number of heavy wars? So this is something I cannot uh, answer, actually, but hope that in a discussion with many people together, we can find some solutions. Okay, last but not least, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology here in Hamburg for TS Bach code support and maintenance. Um, the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry, also for climate data bias correction, and in particular also the Swedish National Infrastructure for Computing at Linköping University for giving me the opportunity to do all these simulations at their computers. Thank you very much, and I'm happy for getting questions. <laughs>